Today is Thursday. We're no longer marching 4th. We are March 5th. <laughs> yes, we are. Today is Thursday, it is, and this is Wayne Goldsboro Television. I'm Wayne Alley. And I'm Kim Best. Good Thursday morning. Glad to have you with us. Oh, yeah. Don't forget, this weekend is the big spring forward. That's move right. your clocks an hour ahead. And we're not saying just move them to another table. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Springing forward. Spring, spring your clock forward. Okay. Oh, I'm so looking forward to I it. I am too. I, I do enjoy it. Now, when I was a younger person, I enjoyed nighttime. Yes. So I wasn't real crazy. And when I say younger, I'm talking about, you know, like 100 years ago. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, so anyway, I do enjoy it now, though. I do too. Very much so. Uh, daylight saving time begins this Sunday. Okay. Today, Ooh. March 5th, is name tag day. Uh -oh. I should have brought my name tag. Uh, should have brought mine yeah, too. Should have brought yours too. <laughs> Today is also World Book Day. World Book. World Book. You know, people. What do you mean by World Book? World Book it was an encyclopedia. The encyclopedias. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> people used to go door to door selling World yes. Book. Yes. Yes. They don't do that anymore because it's all available digitally. Online. Yeah. That's right. Oh, that's you right. can Google anything, or don't have true. to be Google. You can search anything. That's right. That's right. Thank you for that. There's so many search engines. I know. And Google has, has gone the way of uh, Xerox and Band-Aid. And uh, that name has become synonymous with whatever the action is. Yes. But uh, searching is searching. So, That's exactly so right. there you go. And there are, there are many besides, and I mean many besides Google. <coughs> yes, Pardon there me. are. Okay. What's uh, going on? Well, I have a list of birthdays here. Today is right. James Noble's birthday. And if you remember the program Benson... Yes, I absolutely do. He was the governor. Okay. James Noble was the governor, uh -huh. and he is 93 today. 93? Yeah, he is 93. Wow. James, Good for him. James Sicking, not just James Sicking, but James B. Sicking. He made a, a, a point of making sure his middle initial was, was on the credits. James B. Sicking was on Hill Street Blues. Okay. I can't remember the character's name. I remember that name. show well. I do, too. I love that show. But uh, he, uh, he played, I can't remember the character's name, but he was uh, always... Very, very, uh, well, never mind that. Anyway, he's having a birthday. He's 81 today. Paul Sand is 80. Dean Stockwell, a child star, and then went on and grew up and became a star on Quantum Leap and Battlestar Galactica. Oh, yeah. oh, we used to watch that show, Quantum he's 79. Leap. Did you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, he, he didn't play uh, Scott Bakula. Uh -huh. He played the other guy. Okay. Okay. Dean Stockwell, 79. Eddie Hodges was quite a star when he was a youngster. Then he grew up and he didn't become quite a star after that. He's 68 today. Marsha Warfield. Lenore? She was on, yeah, you remember her from Night Court. Okay, she yes. She was the bailiff. Oh, wow, uh, okay. Yeah, she was very tough. Anyway, she's 61 today. Uh, Jonathan Penner is on Naked Truth and Rude Awakening, 53. Eva Mendez has done a ton of stuff. She's 41. Jill Ritchie's 41. Jolene Blaylock, she's commander to Paul on Star Trek Enterprise. Okay. She's 40 today. Kimberly McCullough, Robin Scorpio on General Hospital years ago. Okay. Well, not that long ago. She's only 37. Uh, Sterling Knight is Xander on Melissa and Joey. He's 26. She's 26. Somebody's 26. <laughs> Jake Lloyd is young Angelo on The Pretender and J little Jimmy Sweet on ER. Jake Lloyd is 26 today, and those are the birthdays. Happy birthday, Happy Fisher everything. Special Day. There you go. That's right. And it's Thursday. All day long. All day, which means tomorrow, and that's your stuff. Yes, Good it is. Right right here. So, for the next three weekends. Yes. We Three have weekends. big events going on at the Paramount. Do we? Three weekends in a row. What's going Cheaper on? by the dozen. That's good. That's the production this weekend, Friday, good. Saturday, and Sunday, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. by Center Stage Theater. Mm -hmm. Next weekend, the Goldsboro Ballet is putting on The Little Mermaid. They'll really? have uh huh. They'll have shows Saturday and Sunday. The Little Mermaid. Well, uh huh. They are being put on by Goldsboro Ballet. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. I did read that right. Mm -hmm. Then the third weekend, March 20th weekend, uh -huh. Dance for Christ, mm -hmm. which artistic productions will be performing all weekend long. Wow. Then following that, we're going to have some Paramount movies. One of yours, might be one of your favorites, John Wayne, Rio Lobo. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that is one of my favorites. I thought it might I be. I love Rio Lobo. That's yeah. Tuesday, March the 31st. That'll yeah. be taking place. Yeah, that's So incredible. lots of exciting events going on, as always, yeah. at our local downtown Paramount Theater. All right. Let's yeah. see now. If you enjoy origami. Oh, who me? Origami. Origami. Ah! <laughs> if you enjoy origami. Oh, no, what is origami? <laughs> I've never heard of that. 
That's I'm just, cute. I'm just playing. I know you I are. Know. Okay, uh, it's, got, it's a class that's offered. Banks Peacock put a class together, and they're gonna have a uh, they have a class every. I think I think every Monday. Okay. At the senior center, if you're into origami, you need to. The class is free and open to anybody 60 and older. Nice. Uh, registration is not needed. Just call Aaron to get more information. Uh, springtime is here, and and. Of course, Easter is right around the corner. So, anyway, on uh, Mondays we're going to have that uh, origami class. Uh, yes. If you want to know more about it, 705-1785-1785. Origami. <laughs> well, <laughs> to have a little fun. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course, don't forget the Wayne Shrine Club. That's Spring right. Spring Fish Fry coming up April 10th. Okay. That's exactly right. All right. And don't forget this Sunday. No, I believe it's next Sunday. Next Sunday, March the 15th. If you're interested, go out to. Uh, Cliffs of the New State Park. They've got the free boat rides from 2 until 4 p.m. Oh, boy. It says that you can ride on a paddle boat, a canoe, any of their boats. That are, they have an 11-acre lake. Boats will be available on a first-come, first-served basis. Meet at the lake house. That's what they're calling it. Mm. 2 to 4 p.m. won't cost you a thing. Better to have an 11-acre lake than to have a, an 11-acre lake. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Where do these things come from? I don't know. Where do they come from? I don't from? know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I do want to mention. Yes. Again, our congratulations to uh, Jeff Holtz. Jeff Holtz last yes. week. Yes. The Amal Rosenthal Award, a very coveted That's award. That's fantastic. Awarded to someone who uh, uh, United Way of Wayne County feels that uh, they just uh, epitomize and represent uh, the County of Wayne in volunteerism. Well, that is certainly Jeff Holtz. That is Jeff Holtz. He's that a hard is for sure. There. He is also our. Congratulations to uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Todd Balance of the northern part of the county. They were the uh, producers of the year for 2014 as we went out to the Livestock Association. Oh, uh, excellent. Uh, livestock. And, you know, the Livestock Development Association owns the Wayne County Fair. Exactly. Wayne Regional mm -hmm. Agricultural Fair. And they have an annual banquet. And uh, they, were, they presented scholarships. It was just a great event the other, the other week there. One, uh, one more thing here real quick. A jumper cable walks into a bar. Bartender says, I'll serve you, but don't start anything. We got to go. We'll be back in here tomorrow at the same time. We will not be back in here tomorrow. <laughs> we will be back in here tomorrow. We will be one. Going to interviews. We're going to interviews. That's what I meant to say. We're going to interviews. See you in a minute. <laughs>
including the 1st, 3rd, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th Infantry of the Louisiana Native Guards. When General Banks handed the flag to the color bearer and told him to protect, defend, die for, but do not surrender this flag, the black sergeant replied, Colonel, I will bring you back this flag in honor or report to God the reason why. Both the 1st Louisiana Native Guards and the 1st Louisiana Inf Infantry, their white counterpart, sustained severe losses at Port Hudson. The 54th Massachusetts was the only black regiment to fight at the Battle of Fort Wagner. The order for other troops to advance was withheld until the 54th could march by and take possession of the column. The assault failed and their losses were heavy. The picture shown here was taken by famed Civil War photographer Matthew Brady. This is the dress parade immediately before they went into battle. Within 60 minutes of taking this picture, most of them were dead. If you've ever seen the movie Glory, you'll remember the scene where Denzel Washington and Matthew Broderick, who portrayed Colonel Shaw, were charging the hill with colors flying and they're both shot and killed. And although the scene of the charge was accurate, the color bearer was actually not killed in real life. His real name was William Carney and he survived that battle. He was photographed carrying that tattered and torn regiment flag. Terribly wounded, he sunk the flagpole into the sand and hunkered down until the battle was over. Afterwards, he stumbled along the beach trying to find anyone alive from the 54th. And he wrote, I had been shot in the hip and fractured my thigh bone. A white soldier from the 100th New York gave me a drink of water and offered to carry the flag. I said, no, sir. No man gets these colors unless he's a 54th Massachusetts man. The New York Regiment led Kearney back to the one lone officer and 30 soldiers that remained of the 54th. Sergeant Kearney delivered the colors to the officers and told his fellow soldiers, boys, the old flag never touched the ground. He returned to Bedford, Massachusetts after the war, became a postal clerk, and later took a job as a messenger at the State House in Boston. He was, one of the first, he was one of the first black recipients of the Congressional Medal of Honor, and he is shown in this picture wearing the Butler Medal. The soldiers of the 54th who served at Fort Wagner saw battle again six months later. They were joined in a lusty Florida by other regiments of the U.S. Colored Troops, the 8th and the 35th Infantry, as well as the 3rd U.S. Artillery and the 1st North Carolina Regiment. The 8th never stood a chance and saw the heaviest regimental losses. They, they led the column and had never been under fire before. Their commander was killed within minutes of the start of the battle. The survivors of the 54th Massachusetts and their white counterparts, the 1st North Carolina, brought up the rear and performed splendidly that day. The New York Herald reported, the 54th North Carolina, the 1st North Carolina and the 54th Massachusetts of the colored troops did admirably. The 1st North Carolina held its position in place with great tenacity and inflicted heavy losses on the enemy. It was cool and steady and never flinched for a moment. The 54th sustained the reputation they had gained at Fort Wagner and bore themselves like soldiers throughout the battle. Other than the battle at Fort Wagner, which involved the 54th, no more bravery was shown by black soldiers than at Milliken's Bend in Louisiana. General Grant had withdrawn all major forces from the fort, leaving one regiment of white troops, the 23rd Iowa, two black heavy artillery regiments, and several companies of black infantry, including new regiments from the 9th Louisiana, the 11th Louisiana, and the 1st Mississippi. The Confederates drove the Union troops toward Milliken's Bend. The fight began soon after dawn on the following morning. Two gunboats, the Choctaw and the Lexington, opened fire on the Confederates but most of the battle was fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Confederates withdrew, not realizing they had just been beaten by black troops who had only been mustered into service 17 days ago. At the Battle of Chaffin's Farm near Richmond, Grant used black and white troops in an effort to weaken the garrison at Petersburg and prevent Confederate troops from being sent elsewhere. Whoever controlled the fortification at Chaffin's Farm controlled Richmond. The battle became one of the most heroic engagements involving U.S. colored troops. Sergeant Major Christian Fleetwood, the first picture I showed you, was present at Chaffin's Farm and carried the colors throughout the battle while sustaining injuries himself, even as 11 other color guards were shot down. 
His bravery was so well documented that day that when the official picture of the white officers of the 4th Infantry was taken, the officers insisted that Sergeant Major Fleetwood be included in the picture. He was also present when General Johnston surrendered at Goldsboro and when General Lee surrendered at Appomattox. He returned to Baltimore after the war, took up his place in business, and married the first black registered nurse in that city. He was the first black soldier awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, which his daughter presented to the Smithsonian in 1948. His medal is currently on display at the American History Museum. He was one of 17 black soldiers awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor after the Civil War, and their names are listed here in alphabetical order. Early in 1861, a former politician and young general by the name of Benjamin Butler gave refuge to a group of runaway slaves who had fled to his quarters at Fort Monroe. He refused to return them to their owner and declare them contraband of war. General Butler had recently learned that the Confederates were already using blacks as laborers to build their own fortifications near Fort Monroe, and he decided to put them to work to his own defenses. It was never his intent to use them in battle, saying they lacked intelligence and military ability. In 1862, when the city of New Orleans fell under his command, it was then that he learned of the fighting spirit that these black soldiers possessed. Under his command, they became one of the fiercest regiments in the U.S. Colored Troops, and he was the first, to com the first commander to appoint black officers from within their own ranks. But it was not until he later transferred to Richmond and commanded the 4th and 6th Regiments that he truly understood the valor and resolve of these soldiers. At Petersburg, he wrote, not a man left his post, even when exposed to that fearsome cannon fire. General Butler lost most of, most of his soldiers at the Battle of Chaffin's Farm. And several months later, he wrote, there, in a space 300 yards long, lay the dead bodies of 543 of my colored comrades, slain in the defense of their country, who had laid down their lives to uphold the flag and its honor as a willing sacrifice. Feeling I had wronged them in the past, and, I, and believing what was the future duty of my country to them, I swore to myself a solemn oath. May my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if ever I fail to defend the rights of these men who have given their lives for me and my country, this day and for their race forever. And God helping me, I will keep that oath. General Butler kept his promise, and in 1864, the Butler Medal was designed to recognize meritorious rate, meritorious or heroic, heroic acts of bravery performed by African-American soldiers fighting for the United States of America. This medal was presented over 200 times during and after the Civil War. The Butler Medal is no longer awarded, but it is recognized as one of the oldest military awards of the United States Army. And I have in my possession one of those precious Butler Medals, which I truly treasure. Here are two of the recipients, both wearing the Congressional Medal of Honor and the Butler Medal. First class boys, as they were called in the U.S. Navy, were generally young men under the age of 17. They were paid $9 a month and performed various sailor duties, including serving as, ser serving as servants on the ships, for the ship's officers, standing watch, helping with work parties, and serving on damage control parties. Pictured are two sailors, Robert Walker of Wilson's Creek, Missouri, and another young man whose name I have not yet found. More black soldiers died of disease in the Civil War than on the battlefield. The Civil War claimed the lives of 40,000 black soldiers, and for each one who died in battle, 11 died as a result of disease or poor medical treatment. It was not an easy task to find white physicians to treat black troops and treat them well. Here are just a few of those heroic white surgeons who volunteered to serve with the U.S. Colored Troops. Medical facilities for the troops were poorly equipped some almost to the point of condemnation. 
There was also the presumption that black soldiers, for some reason, were well suited for duty in unhealthy settings, such as trench dig digging or grave duty. Eight black doctors served in the U.S. Army, even though they had to meet requirements far above and beyond those of white physicians. They also usually found themselves alone and overworked. No matter how brilliant a black doctor might have been, no white doctor was willing to serve as an equal, much less serve under, a black doctor. Here are two of those physicians, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander August and Major Martin Delaney. Dr. Augusta was the, first, was the first black commissioned doctor in the Army, born to free parents in Norfolk, Virginia. He moved to Canada to pursue his medical training after finding it difficult to enroll in medical school in the U.S. He completed his training at Trinity Medical College in Toronto and returned to Baltimore at the beginning of the war to offer his services. In March of 1865, he was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He is buried at Arlington National Cemetery in 1890 with full military honors. Dr. Martin Delaney was from Charlestown, West Virginia, born of a slave father and a free mother. He studied medicine in Pittsburgh, and in 1863, he was commissioned as a major, serving with the 52nd U.S. Colored Infantry. He returned to Charlestown, Charlestown after the war and continued his medical practice until his death in 1885. Religion has always played an important role in the black community, and never so much as on the battlefield. Approximately 3,000 chaplains served the troops of the, U of the U.S. Army. Of these, 158 were black and assigned to the U.S. Colored Troops. The first black chaplain was Reverend Henry McNeil Turner from South Carolina. He was personally appointed by President Lincoln and served with the first U.S. Colored Infantry. Reverend George LeVere was born in Brooklyn and worked as a teacher and pastor before entering service. He served with the 20th U.S. Colored Infantry. Reverend Henry Plummer was born a slave in Maryland. He served with the U.S. Colored Troops as a sailor during the war, and after the war, he re-enlisted in the Army. He was the first post-war black chaplain appointed to serve with the 9th U.S. Colored Cavalry. As difficult as it was for black troops to get decent medical treatment during the war, it was even more difficult afterwards but not so much for the soldiers of the first South Carolina who returned to their homes in the Buford area. The Sisters of Divine Mercy opened a small military hospital in Buford and offered their services, medical and spiritual, to Confederate and Union, black and white alike. Pictured is a portrait of one of the hospital's directors, a Catholic nun, Sister Mary Margaret Joseph. During the Civil War, black women's services included, included nursing or domestic chores in medical settings, laundering, and cooking for the soldiers. As the Union Army marched through the South and large numbers of freed black men enlisted, their female family members often obtained employment with the unit. The Union Army also paid black women to raise cotton on plantations for the Northern government to sell. Five black nurses served under the direction of Catholic nuns aboard the Navy ship, the Red, Ro the Red Rover. Records showed four of their names listed, Alice Kennedy, Sarah Chemo, Ellen Campbell, and Betsy Young. And black nurses are in the record books of both Union and Confederate hospitals. The most well-known remembered was Susie King Taylor, who wrote a book of her experience traveling with the 33rd Infantry. I have her book on display over here, too. As many as 181 black nurses served in convalescent and government hospitals in Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina during the war. Frances Watkins Harper, who was born a free woman in Baltimore and well-educated by her family, spent the latter part of the Civil War working throughout the South, lecturing on civil rights, and was well known for her poetry, depicting the hardship of former slaves. idea where I am. <laughs> so I just thought I'd throw that It is that still on Thursday. Oh, okay. It's still Thursday. It is still March. All right. A fellow walks into a bar. No, wait a minute. You told not, us that already. I did, didn't I? Yes, you All did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good gracious. What time of year, which season is your very favorite and why? That is a tough question. Is it? I love spring, mm -hmm. but I love the fall as well. I hear a lot of people say that. Yeah, I do. I do. Well, look at it this way. Spring, uh, 
gee whiz, there's so many things that it's just like everything is just alive. Up. Right. Everything's alive. New, mm -hmm. new color, new plants, new flowers. New uh, animals out there, birds are singing, it's <laughs> new just so animals. much fun. Yeah, new, <laughs> new animals <laughs> well, out there. Well, you know how that happens, you know. <laughs> animals, as a, as, and then there's new ones, see. And then, in the, then in the fall time, <laughs> uh, I enjoy the color. Well, it, it is pretty how it goes from everything is vibrant and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you're more pinks and your blues and your greens and your yellows, and then all of a sudden fall rolls around and you go into your oranges and golds. Yeah. It is gorgeous. Yeah. It is gorgeous in Goldsboro, Wayne County, especially. both times of year. Yes, especially. And, and, if, and if it's not rich enough color-wise for you around here, the mountains are not that far Absolutely. away. And the coast is right down the street. That's right. So, wow. Well, we are lucky that we, we do still have four seasons. Now, they may cross over quite a bit um, into one another, but we certainly do have four seasons. I mean, we actually can tell the difference. <laughs> Don't look at me like I'm crazy. I was going <laughs> to sing something, you know. Are sharing, you breaking into uh, song? Yeah, the four seasons. Let's you know. hear you. Come on, let's oh, go. No, no, I don't, I don't sing. <laughs> yes, but anyway, do. No, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> no that's just, uh, no, it's, uh, I pretend. Uh, if you play chess, or if you want to learn to play chess, if you're interested in playing chess at the Senior Center, uh, they're going to have a startup meeting on St. Patrick's Day. Oh, nice. March 17th. And that will be at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And if you're a senior who enjoys playing chess, there you go. There you go. There you go. So we talked about earlier that the Paramount always has movies that they play every so often. Yes. You know, they're like $5. I know. Unless you are under the age of 12, then it's free. Doesn't get any better than that. And you can have popcorn and drinks in the Paramount, which is the only time of year they allow that. That's unreal. So I you you like the movie Rio Lobo? Oh, I love Rio Lobo. With John what is Wayne. that? Yeah, I know it's with John Wayne. Uh huh. And uh, it's just I, well, I don't want to get into detail because any you know it's just it's a typical John Wayne. Yes. You know, you got your good guys, you, you got, got your bad, bad guys. guys, you got the pretty girl. Yep. And then you got a lot of horses. <laughs> well, of course you and do. And you got a, you know, a lot of riding around in dust <laughs> and dust and all that. Yes, you yes, know. yes. But it's, it's a great movie. Okay, well, it that'll is. be taking place on, hold on, I can't see. Just one second. Tuesday, so, so not a weekend, Tuesday night, March 31st at 7 o'clock p.m. You can count on seeing that at the Paramount Theater. Yes. You can get tickets ahead of time or you can wait till the evening off. I'm trying to remember who co-starred in that and, I, and it escaped me right now, but that's a... Uh, uh, that's uh, one of my favorites there. All right, fantastic. Uh, we're getting a high sign over here. I believe it's time it, to go. It, it looked like semaphore, you know? You know <laughs> or is that John Travolta? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looked like to me. Good one. <laughs> Good one. Okay, we got to go. Got to get out of here. We'll be back in here tomorrow, which will be the final day of the work week. We'll be back on Friday here at Wayne Goldsboro Television. So until then, I'm Wayne Alley. And I'm Kim Best. And this is what's happening in your community.